introduce Joe Bowling, how fakers messed up their products. I remember be, uh, sitting here at the front table manipulating images on my computer. The only PowerPoint slide I have is the one you're looking at, and we're going to switch over to Windows Photo Viewer because that allows me to zoom in and out to show you the details that we're going to be talking about. I will uh, try to remember to project, and if I'm not being heard, somebody just <clears throat> yell at me that you're not being heard, and I'll make sure you get I get heard. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about obvious errors that you don't need a microscope to, to see. Uh, you know, I'm a counterfeit specialist, and a lot of the counterfeits that I work with, you do need magnification to see. I recommend 20 power magnification, you know, much more than you get with your little handheld loop. But the errors that you're going to see today that counterfeiters are making, almost all, are easily visible to the naked eye, even to the point of a low-resolution eBay image, being able to see these kinds of mistakes uh, in their work. Why they allow this kind of stuff to be created that way is beyond me. I would expect that a, a counterfeiter would take a little more care with his work, but you'll see some really dumb errors in uh, some of these notes. Now, what do you see that's wrong with the uh, one of these notes here? Anybody notice anything peculiar? Well, they have different charter numbers, that's correct. Look at those signatures. You ever see rubber stamp signatures on a small size national? I never had. Now this guy apparently, you know, the large size nationals have been circulating for decades and a lot of them had rubber stamp signatures. This is an intaglio counterfeit. This is an engraved plate, except for the bank data. The bank data is letterpress, which means he could have taken this plate and used it to make any number of different banks counterfeits by just changing the bank data in the note. To, because, as I say, the main plate is in Talio. Now, going back to the first slide here, uh, something interesting about this bank, the Champagne National Bank of Urbana, there's actually two, two things of interest here. The font in Champagne is clearly different from the font of the National Bank of. And all I can figure is that when they made this device for, for printing this portion of the note, and Peter would have to remind me of what they called that, that they had misspelled champagne. And they had to go back in and correct the champagne spelling, and in the process of doing that, they didn't duplicate the other font. Now, the counterfeit doesn't show that. The counterfeit has everything all the same. The other thing that's uh, odd about this note is whoever was separating the notes of this bank in the bank didn't have a paper cutter. You see here at the top where how short it is here and it arches up and then short down here at this end. If you go on the heritage site and pull up the notes of this bank, every single one of them is badly cut. It's a signature of that particular bank. Now the counterfeit doesn't have that on it either. Of course the counterfeiter probably didn't realize that every note from that bank in small size is going to have that kind of uh, error. Well, they did get the, uh, the uh, uh, charter number wrong. This charter number down here is from Lockport, New York, and there are no counterfeits I know of from Lockport. It's possible that, and you're going to see some other examples of, of wandering charter numbers as we go through these slides, it's possible that they were deliberately not using the home bank's charter number because the counterfeit detectors would sometimes identify the counterfeits by charter number. And if you had a different number on the note that you know, was trying to be passed that didn't match the counterfeit detectors, then it might be accepted uh, in commerce. Uh, that's the only speculation I can come up with of why they wouldn't match the charter number. But the, the real kicker on this one is those signatures. You know, they, they just don't come that way in the small size series. 
Here's another example of a misused design. Now this one you wouldn't be able to tell uh, except by blowing up the, uh, the image. We have a hologram on this note. There's no hologram up here. The original note issued in 1991 had no hologram. In 1996, they put one on. Well, this note's dated 1991. Now, why would he use a 1991 note to, to put his hologram on? Because if there's a hologram on a 1996 note and he's trying to copy it, he's got to deal with that hologram in his image that he's printing from before he puts on his real foil mounted holographic image on his counterfeit. So if he starts out with an image that has no hologram on it, that simplifies his job as a counterfeiter. So that's, that's why we end up with a 1991 date on what should be a 1996 note. This is not a bad hologram. Uh, I, I didn't uh, make a picture of the, of the genuine note, but uh, this does have holographic uh, content. You know, when you rotate that, uh, that foil, it does change colors. So that's a fairly good counterfeit. Here's another example of missing the boat on the design. Kelly on the counter on the genuine note, Taylor on the counterfeit. Now this is a state against state counterfeit. This was done on a high security press by some government. We don't know what government. The speculation is it was the Soviet Union. Why would the Soviets be counterfeiting the Burmese notes in the 1930s? because the Burmese rupee was tied to sterling, which is a hard currency, and they could use them in international trade. The note itself is a, a laminated note with a watermark laminated between the two pieces of paper. So you got two pieces of paper with a paste watermark glued in between them. It's a very good uh, copy of the original note, but they blew the signature and they blew the, uh, the block. S88 is the only block that was used for these ones that say legal tender in Burma only. Now we have on these notes the legend in black in the middle. And I can only speculate that that was sometimes hard to see, especially on a well circulated note. So they then went to putting red legends in the margins, which are easier to see. But this same counterfeiter also counterfeited the 10 rupee note and he put the legend in the middle of the note, not where it belongs. So he did get the signatures right. He got Kelly, the, the correct signature on his note, but he didn't put the, uh, the overprint in the right location on the counterfeited note. And if you hold this up and look at the light, uh, the watermark, uh, is a very ugly King George V. I mean, just looking at the watermark, you can think, boy, there's something awfully peculiar about this note if you didn't know anything else was wrong with it. Here's another example of uh, missing the boat. The genuine note has a shadowed font. You see those little lines to the, to the bottom and to the right of each character for the first three lines, the Military Administration of Burma. There's no shadowing on these two lines here. The counterfeiter did not have that fancy font. As a result, his word administration falls short of the dimensions of the word rupee, whereas on the genuine, administration stretches beyond. So this is one that you certainly can see on eBay. You can pick that out because you can see that that word doesn't... Uh, it extends beyond the ends, the ends of rupee in both cases. The counterfeiter also added an A here, which was not necessary, but if he was going to do it, he should have done it in gray, because this A is part of the main plate. It's got to be the same color as the frame. And he instead made it green, a gray-green color. I could see that on the eBay image as well. So I, I knew there was a problem with this note when I bought it, since I collect counterfeits, that's why I was buying it. And here's one last example of missing the, uh, the design. These notes uh, were printed in France. 
This is a French polychrome technique, a combination of letterpress and intaglio. The counterfeits, the, the first round of counterfeits of these were made for circulation. They were made to be actually used in Cambodia. Once the pick catalog put a high value on the counterfeits, counterfeiters started reproducing the counterfeits to sell to collectors. Wow, wow. So there's at least two versions of counterfeit counterfeits <laughs> of this note, and this is one of them. This one you hardly ever see, and how he did this, I've got no idea. Look at this imprint down here. The diacritical marks underneath the left end here match the diacritical marks under the right end here. It's, it's a mirror image. The imprint is a mirror image of what it should be. Now, if you read Cambodian, that would be real obvious. But of course, if you don't read Cambodian, it goes right over your head. And that may be intentional because counterfeiters like to sign their work. Counterfeiters like to be able to distinguish their notes from genuine notes at a glance in circulation so they don't end up taking some of their own stuff back. So this may have been intentional on the part of the counterfeiter. That's the only thing I can conclude. I mean, otherwise, there's, there's no logical reason for why that imprint would be reversed when everything else on the note is not. All right, here's a fake error. Somebody was trying to make it look like a full face offset on the back of this $2 bill. But he failed to recall that a, uh, a transfer like this, an offset, is a mirror image of the original design. So he's got a face on fake offset here. Everything reads correctly. Plus, offsets don't include seals and serial numbers, because those are put on on a different press at a different time. You, you, know, you can't get all of that offset on a single note. So this obviously was beyond the ken of this counterfeiter, uh, and it was also was beyond the ken, apparently, of the dealer who I bought it from, because he didn't realize until I handed it to him and showed it to him that he had a fake error there. He thought he had a good offset. He, I don't know how much money he paid for it, but I ended up getting it for face value, two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> now here's a fantasy note. There are notes of this bank and this series that say Chongqing. When the Japanese lost, or when the Chinese lost Nanking, they had to move their government out of Nanking when the Japanese overran it, and move their government to Chongqing. At the same time, the Japanese were aggressively withdrawing these uh, circulating notes in China because they had trade value in international commerce and they were using them to buy war material. So the Chinese said, all right, we're not going to honor notes that don't have a Chongqing overprint. We've moved our government to Chongqing. We're now going to overprint all our notes with Chongqing. And anything that gets presented uh, for redemption that doesn't say that is going to be turned away. Well, at that point, the 10 yuan note, which this is one of, the value had fallen so low that it was not worth the time to overprint the notes Chongqing. So they didn't. So this note never got this overprint. It should not have had this overprint, which is why I call it a fantasy. In addition to that, the notes that did say Chongqing in Chinese on the face had big Roman characters across here saying Chongqing, C-H-U-N-G-K-I-N-G. And this counterfeiter failed to note that he should have put Chongqing on the back as well if he was going to put it on the face. So he missed the boat on that one. Here we have modern People's Republic of China specimens. These are all fake specimens. These are genuine notes on which the serial numbers have been removed and zero serial numbers have been applied using both inkjet, I'm sorry, uh, letterpress and silkscreen. You see there's two different fonts in use here. These two here are silkscreen fonts. These two are letterpress fonts. But as the specimen said, all specimen number 342. But how are we supposed to believe that the Chinese, when they were making their specimens, printed the first ones in 1980 and held those numbers for 16 years until they got to the last ones 
so that they can make a set all with the same specimen serial number on it. You know, it just beggars the mind of, of belief. So if, if you had this set offered to you, you should immediately think that doesn't make any sense. You know, these things couldn't be original. And in fact, they're not original. None of them are original. All four of these are fake specimens. This is one that never had the overprint. The Lorenzo Marquet, underneath this Cabo Verde, you can't really make it out, but it says Lorenzo Marquet, were the Mozambique circulating notes. And they were overprinted for Cape Verde in letterpress, in black, right over that original locale indicator on these uh, Portuguese colonial notes. But the 20 centavo was never overprinted. Only the 10 and 50 centavos were overprinted. Yes, this is in the standard catalog. So the counterfeiter looks in the standard catalog and he says, all right, 10, 20, 50, these are fairly common notes of Mozambique that I can pick up and I can put Cape Verde overprints on them and sell them for a ton of money. But the standard catalog is wrong in listing the 20 centavos as having this overprint. It never had the overprint legitimately. In addition, this overprint is very badly done. Uh, you can see how the, the ink is, has run out in all directions around the edges. Those should be nice crisp edges of letterpress printing, and they're not. Uh, this counterfeiter only used that style of overprint for a couple of eBay names, and then he, uh, he got a, a, a much better inkjet image, crisper, which looks better to the naked eye. He's never done these things in letterpress. You know, if he had a true letterpress printing operation, he could overprint these things and make a lot of money on them. But all of his work is inkjet. This is another form of inkjet, but his printer was not well calibrated when it was doing this work. This particular guy is now on his 19th eBay name. I've been tracking him for about eight years. This is the German note, Imperial uh, German note before World War I, overprinted in Persian for commercial use in Persia during and after World War I by an entrepreneur who had a connection at the print plant. And these were actually prepared at the Reichsdruckerei at the time the notes were were initially printed. These were not overprinted on finished notes. These were printed at the same time the notes were printed and on the notes that have red seals and serials, or actually red-orange seals and serials, the red-orange overprint matches because it was printed on the same press at the same time. You look at the 20 mark note which has the red overprint, they have to match. If they don't match, it's not genuine. Well, this one's a little tougher because the seals and seals are blue rather than red. However, we know what blocks were used. This is recorded in Holger Rosenberg's book, uh, now taken up by Grabowski, that on the 10 mark note, only block J was overprinted. Now, not all of block J was overprinted. You can find block J notes without the overprint and then add your own overprint to try to make money. But this counterfeiter, not only picked the wrong block, he didn't even put on the right overprint. He missed this one over here and he put the wrong one over here. You know, I don't know what this guy was, was smoking when he was building these notes, but he just missed the boat totally on this one. <laughs> Tibetan overprints on Chinese notes. Same deal here. These are not added to finished notes. These are added in the press at the same time the seals are, are printed. So these colors have to match. You can see right off that these colors don't match. But this is much more orange than this one. This is a more like pinkish red. And this is quite orange. So that can't be original because they don't match. In addition to that, the guy couldn't read Tibetan. It's a 5 yuan note, but he put on an overprint here that says 50 yuan. <laughs> On the other side, it does say 5 yuan. Over here you see a 5 character overprint that says 5, uh, 5 yuan. And back here it's a 7 character overprint that says 50 yuan. So 
even if you can't tell on the colors on eBay, you can certainly tell from the length of the imprint here that it's not the correct imprint. Now there's another little tell on some of these that are incorrect. This one doesn't have it. This character here is incorrect on some of the ones that uh, are, have the uh, forged Tibetan overprints. Uh, this doesn't have to be one of them. The plate that was used for this counterfeit was used for several different banks. In the National Bank Note period, once a counterfeit was published in the counterfeit detectors of the time, the bankers aggressively withdrew the notes and returned them to the controller for redemption, the genuine ones. The counterfeits, of course, uh, they couldn't do anything with. But then the controller would not ship this note to that bank again until the bank changed its charter. If the bank uh, renewed its charter, at which point all of its notes had to change, then they would ship them the denomination again. Of course, the twos were only in the uh, original series and series of 1875, so charter renewals in 1882 couldn't get $2 notes anyway. There were none. But the fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, uh, once they were published in the counterfeit detectors, that bank couldn't, issue, couldn't get any more of those notes from the controller. The result of that is that today all we have to collect is the counterfeits. It's very difficult to match one of these uh, circulating counterfeits from that period with a genuine note. And I don't have a genuine from the Ninth National. But this is about the fourth bank that used this particular plate. Once the note was published in the detectors, then the counterfeiters would change the plate. They would change the title of the bank to a different bank that had not yet been counterfeited. So you've got the Marine National Bank in New York, you've got the St. Nicholas National Bank in New York, you've got the National Bank of Kinderhook, uh, there's an Oneida National Bank in uh, Utica that all use the same Lazy Deuce plate successively being changed to new bank names. Well, when the guy did this one, he forgot that the original plate said just New York, Ninth National Bank of New York. But this one says City of New York. It should say of the City of New York. And the word the was omitted from the counterfeit plate. On a genuine note, the word the is present. So another example of not getting the design quite right. And certainly that could have been added in if they thought about it or realized it or, or wanted to take the time to do it because they were changing the entire bank name and title and the uh, tablet here that, that said City of New York instead of simply saying New York. Okay, this is a circulating counterfeit. I've seen several different serial numbers of this note. The tell on this one is the seal. You see the seal up here, Thesor Amer Septent Sigil, seal of the treasury of North America, all in Latin, but, or abbreviated Latin, but easily legible. And on the counterfeit, oops, it's a mirror image. It starts over here and goes around this way backwards. And everything that's, that's dark blue here, all these spots between the rosettes, are white on the genuine. It's a full mirror image. And they didn't just do it on the fives. Here's a ten with that same seal on it. So both fives and tens were counterfeited by this particular gang. And... You know, again, why would they not get the seal right if they're getting everything else right? You know, I, I don't understand what's going on with these guys thinking. Did the yeah. serial numbers change? The serial numbers did change, yes. As, as I said, I've, I think I've recorded three different serial numbers for the five. I've only recorded one for the ten. Uh, but then the serials are, are fairly far apart. Now, I don't know how many they actually printed. They could have, you know, jumped them up. Uh, and spread them out, but uh, here's the, the embedded silk threads in the genuine note. You see they're quite fine 
and they're scattered in two uh, areas on both sides of the uh, portrait. Here's the counterfeit five, and you can see they're very clunky looking. And here's the counterfeit ten. Also, they're not clumped up together so much, but they're, they're not as fine threads as the ones in the original. I'm still looking at seals. Here's a seal we know and love on silver certificates. And here's a seal this guy devised. And it's, 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 you know, the font is completely different. The, the dimensions of the letters are different. The whole thing just looks peculiar to anybody who knows the series. If you pick up this note and look at it, you don't even have to look at the face, which is not very well done. This is not an intaglio counterfeit. It's a fairly ugly counterfeit. But one glance at that seal and you know that this is a, this is a problem note. Okay, so they then took that seal and they did it in red on U.S. notes. But look what they did. They left silver certificate up in here in the frame. And this seal is also a mirror image. It's not even, doesn't even read right. So, but it's the same seal, same counterfeiter, just making two different series of notes as they come out of his shop. Now here's one that started out as a North African gold seal note. And you can tell that from the serial number. That, that's a gold seal serial number. These were not just used in North Africa. They were used all over Europe during the war. And especially in Italy, as the troops, the Allied troops, fought their way up the boot of Italy to liberate Rome and, you know, try to move the Germans up into the fatherland. A lot of these notes with the gold seals got spent in the local economies, and a lot of Italians ended up holding them at the end of the war. And they were afraid they were going to be demonetized as a military-related issue with no uh, applicability to the civilian use later. They were afraid that the gold seal notes would be demonetized, but they knew that circulating in the U.S. simultaneously were blue seal notes in the same series. So if they pull the gold seal off and put a blue seal on, then they can make it look just like all the other circulating silver certificates. Now here's the counterfeit seal, and here's the uh, genuine seal, and the tell here is the R. See these bulbous tails on the R? See these little scrawny, stumpy tails on these R's? Even if you don't have the serial numbers memorized, if you look at the note and you think this might be one that could have a converted seal on it, just look at those R's. And if you see something that looks like that, quietly buy it and go home and chuckle over your seal. <laughs> Uh, I've, I picked, I've got two of these now. I picked one of them off a of uh, Heritage Tuesday night sale and, and with another note, another regular uh, silver certificate right along with it so I could compare both seals side by side in the same lot. <laughs> and this uh, is also an unfin a late finish plate 86, which you know makes it a nice piece. The other one I cherry picked out of a dealer's stock at one of the Michigan State shows because I knew what the serial numbers were, and I, I, you know, I looked at the serial and said, this is in the yellow seal block. And then I checked the, uh, the seal, and sure enough, it had that stumpy little tail. So there's, uh, Peter will tell you there's only six or seven of these known at the present time. I'm still looking for the next one we're going to look at here. They went on to change them to Fed notes, except they didn't change silver certificate. But they took off the big blue tin and put on a nice Federal Reserve seal. They put on a, a green seal. They actually printed that over the yellow seal. You can see the yellow seal is still under there. The, uh, the blue ones, they actually stripped the yellow seal off before they put the blue seal on. But the font, they completely blew. I mean, there's never been a serial number font that looks like that in a small size issue. So. If you find one of these things in somebody's stock and it's got a font like that, grab it. As far as I know, there's only two of them known. One's in Texas and one's in Wisconsin. <laughs> I don't own one of these yet. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm looking. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, here's another example of not getting the font right. You can see how large this font is here on the genuine note and how tiny this font is on the counterfeit. This is an official counterfeit. This is an Australian government counterfeit of the Timor note for the liberation of Timor. Timor was a Portuguese colony. When the Australians were ready to go in and kick the Japanese off the island, they went to Portuguese and said, can you give us some notes that we can use locally when we go ashore? And the Portuguese says, we're neutrals in this fight. We can't talk to you. Go away. Don't bother us. So the Australians said, well, to hell with you guys. We're going to make them anyway. And they, uh, they counterfeited four denominations of Timorese notes. They used the same font for the serials on all four denominations. And only one does the size match. The font doesn't match anyway, but the size does match. But on the other three, the size doesn't match the genuine serial number font size. So I was able to pick one of them off of eBay, uh, cherry pick it off somebody's offerings of, of Timorese notes just by looking at the size of the font in the serial number. And a last one on fonts. This font was never used on any legitimate Chinese note that I know of. But it appears on many replicas of Chinese notes, including Chinese bonds. If you ever see this scrawny, tall, jammed up font in a serial number on a Chinese note, just push it away. It's not original. It's somebody's replica of that note. <clears throat> This is the same counterfeiter that I already talked about who's on his 19th eBay name. <laughs> uh, this is a genuine note which belongs to me. I bought it off eBay from a legitimate uh, English auctioneer. And when I got it and checked it all out, I put in my feedback on eBay. This note, unlike most of the other Fizan notes being offered on eBay, is genuine. Within two weeks, he had lifted this image from the eBay lot, from the English auction house that I'd bought it from, and moved it onto one of his notes. Now you can see that he got the size wrong. He's, he's dimensionally challenged. Uh, you know, he, he frequently doesn't know how big the, the image is supposed to be on a genuine note. Even though he's lifting these images from genuine notes, he still screws it up. And if you'll notice here on my note, this RF overlaid some red printing here, and that got carried over into here. Those red portions are still in the black R's. Now, he cleaned that up later. Uh, you know, in later versions of this image, he, he got that red out and made it all black. That you wouldn't be able to see on eBay anyway, but you certainly would be able to see the, the oversized version of the stamp. This guy has sold hundreds of these Fazan notes in the years that I've been following him, literally. I mean, he's destroyed the market in Fazan notes. Uh, they used to be a once every 25 years you'd find one. Now you can find one on eBay 15 to 30 times a year because of all of the work he's done. And I can't get eBay to pay any attention to him at all. I report every one of them as a, a, a prohibited transaction. I report about five notes a week on this guy for prohibited transactions. And not, not one of them has ever been taken down. Here's another one of his. This is the German Behelfzollung's middle notes. They're versions of MPC that uh, were used in Greece with overprints to re-denominate re these in Greek currency during their hyperinflation at the end of the war. The original notes have a rubber stamp here with a Nazi seal on it and a Greek stamp over here which is two millimeters larger than the German seal. So this guy originally, these are both inkjet, had his seals the same size. So you could tell that by, by just looking at it. If, if this seal is the same size as the German seal, it's not original. 
he then found, a, either found or had made, I don't know which, a real rubber stamp for this seal. So he now has a genuine rubber stamp that he uses for this seal that has all the correct wording and the, the number seven down here, but he has not yet gotten a real rubber stamp for this one. So he's still using inkjet for that. He's got the size right now. He's got the dimensions correct. Uh, so the, they're hard to distinguish these things on eBay now because you know the, the image that he gives you on eBay uh, makes it real easy or hard to, uh, to distinguish these kinds of details. But once you get it in hand, if you look at it at the 20 power and you see that this is not a real rubber stamp, it's, it's an inkjet image, then you know that you've got a, one of his bad pieces. And there's a lot of them floating around too. He's got one up this week. Peru. Peru is a counterfeiter's heaven. Uh, there are more counterfeits being made now in Peru than anywhere else in the world. These are, these are counterfeits for circulation. U.S., uh, you know, the Secret Service went down there about six months ago and had a big bust, a lot of publicity. Took down about 20 different operators in one night. Uh, they're all lithographed hundreds. They're, they're not doing super notes in Peru. They're, they're doing high quality lithography. And they're putting the, th the threads in, and they've got fake watermarks. I mean, the, the security features look great when the note's in your hand. You've got to really study it to, to realize that you've got a fake in your hand. The Peruvian government has had its notes also counterfeited by those same guys. <clears throat> Every time Peru wants to issue a different series, you know, a new, new date, they ask for bids from printers again. They don't keep the same printer from date to date. Every time they change dates, they change the printer. Well, whoever's the low bidder that month gets the lot, gets the job. And when those notes are exhausted, they put out bids again and then get another printer to print another batch of notes, same design, new date. Well, the counterfeiters are not paying any attention to the, the printer's name on the back. It's down here at the bottom left-hand corner. You can see that the genuine note here was done in Germany by Giesecke and de Vrindt. The counterfeit note says it was done by Thomas Delarue, wherever, whatever plant Delarue is using. They've got plants all over the place now. <clears throat> but there is no Delarue genuine with this date on it, because all the, all the genuine ones of that date were done in Germany. That's something you're not going to be able to pick up on eBay. All right, why would, these are, these are 1990 signatures, Bill uh, Pondo and Brady, and this is dated 1988. Why would this counterfeiter use a 1990 image for his signatures, but date it 1988? Think a second, there's a, there's a very good reason. What happened in 1990? What did we put in the note in 1990 that was not in the 1988 note? Thread. The polymer thread. Oh. That's right. So tellers, you know, not going to pay any attention to signatures, <clears throat> but they could well pay attention to dates. And certainly when, this, when the 1990s were released, there was a lot of publicity about them. You know, we've added this security feature. Look for it in your new notes. So the counterfeiter put a 1988 date. Then he didn't have to worry about the thread. He didn't have to put a thread in his counterfeit. Didn't have to put a fake thread or a real thread or you know any kind of impression of a thread. He could just use plain old paper. You get the same thing with the notes that are made from genuine one dollar bills that have had the ink all stripped off, which have no thread in them. The small head 88 dated hundreds get printed on that genuine paper because the paper has all the little silk fibers in it that you can see with the naked eye if you're looking for them. And it feels correct and it doesn't re react to the pen because it doesn't have any starch in it. So the, uh, the same ploy is being used you know, to this day by people uh, stripping off uh, $1 notes and putting hundreds on them. If you went on the tour of the Fed two days ago, you learned that these small head notes are being aggressively withdrawn. 
They're not being reissued by the Fed. So every time one of these small head notes hits the Fed these days, it's curtains for that note. It goes in a shredder. Ozone Park, First National. I don't have a genuine of this note yet. <clears throat> Notice the, uh, the charter numbers. They're not the same. Two different counterfeits, same counterfeiter. If you look at the note, 8865 is the correct charter number. So this one's got it, but this one doesn't. You know, why are they treating these as serial numbers? Are they, as I said, trying to evade the counterfeit detectors that would indicate that the 8865 notes might be bad? I don't know. Uh, I don't remember where 8835 is, but it's not the Ozone Park, New York. <clears throat> Grand Rapids National City Bank. <clears throat> this is a genuine note with uh, rubber stamp signatures. There's a genuine, 3293. Here's a counterfeit, 3293. This one happens to say assistant cashier. All the counterfeits I've seen say assistant cashier. I'm still looking for a genuine note that says assistant cashier, but I assume one exists because I'm sure they copied that from an original note. But it's possible they might have stuck that on there as their, as their signature so they could say, okay, if it says assistant, it's one of ours, we don't want that one. Uh, I don't know at this point. If I ever find the genuine with assistant on it, then I'll know that they copied it from a genuine note. So there's 3293. There's a piece of paper that came with that note. <clears throat> Cambria is a little wide spot in the road. I mean, a really tiny, not even an incorporated uh, town, right on the southern border of Michigan near the corner where Ohio and Indiana butt up against the bottom of Michigan. <clears throat> so that note sat in some bank for a long time, just being used for reference. And here we've got two more counterfeits from the same counterfeiter. They both say assistant, but two more uh, charter numbers. Neither one of these charter numbers is on the one that we saw before. So this guy's, and, and if you, you track the serials, they're not that far apart. The serial back here was 52341, uh, five, this one's 52394, 52343. They're, you know, they're, they're not going up by leaps and bounds. They're not going up in the same direction as the charter numbers are changing or by the same amount that the charter numbers are changing. So it doesn't look like they were treating these as serial numbers that had to be linked to this number or this number up here. These numbers don't travel together either. Uh, they, you know, if this one went up by two, this one might have gone up by five. Uh, non corpus mentis. You know, I just don't understand the, the thinking of, of some of these fakers. <clears throat> Tamaqua, the, probably the most famous of the wandering charter numbers. I've recorded 17 different charter numbers on Tamaqua notes. This is a genuine one here. That's the genuine Tamaqua charter. It's the only genuine Tamaqua note I've ever seen. Uh, it took me two tries to get it. <laughs> This is one, the three-digit number, 837, counterfeit. Here's a four-digit number, 1502, also counterfeit. Indiana, we've got Lafayette, Muncie, and Richmond, all from the same counterfeiters, all with the same serial numbers. All with the same bank numbers, but not all with the same charter number. Two have got 346 and one has no charter at all. 346 belongs to Vive, Indiana, from where no counterfeits are known. I don't know where Vive, Indiana is. Maybe it's just a coincidence it's another Indiana town. These were published in the counterfeit detectors as all, not only do they have the same, char same numbers on these three notes, they've got the same numbers on every note they printed. 
They never change the numbers on any of these three banks' counterfeits. And if you go into the counterfeit detectors of the period, here's the Richmond, <coughs> and that federal number falls right in this range here. So that was, in fact, a Richmond note that they copied the numbers from. And the bank number falls right in here exactly where it should. What do we got here? 1496. <laughs> if you add 1496 to uh, the first, uh, the, the preceding number, which would have been, would have been 164671, then it, it, the, the number matches up. It, it, that's why these were printed in the counterfeit detectors. They said, compare the two numbers. If you don't get uh, you know, a number that is compatible with, I mean, say you had a, a federal number that was 164673, it would have to be 1,002 on the bank number. And you know, similarly, all the way up. If you add 100 to this, you have to add 100 to this. And, Bankers were provided this information in these counterfeit detectors for all of the original series notes. After that, the BEP never provided the, that data again to the counterfeit detector publishers, but they did for the original series. Rochester, Flower City National Bank, same serial number on both notes. If you're going to not bother to change them, why make them so conspicuous? Why, why make them crooked and so, so obvious? You know, make them less, con less easy to notice. Plus, they've got the wrong number of digits in the numbers, and they don't have any prefix or suffix on the numbers. So they're missing the vote on that one, too. And it goes on. Here's, here's three counterfeits, all with the same serial number. These are all inkjet. They all came to me from the same source, but they traveled separately before he got them and passed them to me because this one on the top here got wet. When, when inkjet gets wet, it runs. And so this ink ran because the note was wet. You can actually see some running up here on this one too, on Jackson's hair, where the note got wet right there. Almost any inkjet note that has, count, that has circulated will have these little water runs on them. It's astounding how often a, a banknote gets wet in circulation. Almost no inkjet counterfeits that I have that were made for circulation, that were not made just to sell to collectors, fail to have some place on it where the ink has run. So if, again, if you have a note in your hand that you're suspicious of, Check it out for little ink runs like that. If you find one, you got an inkjet copy, not, a, uh, not an original note. Now, laser copies do not run. So a laser copy, you're not going to be able to use that dis uh, distinguisher on. Okay, we know now, these are all series 1996, that all 96s start with A, then you got the district letter. The district letter is repeated here and a district number comes here. This counterfeiter put a G instead of a leading A on his 1996. G didn't show up until series 2004A. So anytime you got a 96 that doesn't start with A, you got a bad note. He did get the K matching and he got the 11 okay. This fellow got the F's matching, but he failed to notice that F has to go with six, and he put F with one. He got the A okay, but he didn't get this one right. And this fellow got the, the A wrong, and the A to F wrong, and the F to two wrong. <laughs> you know, he, he booted it three times in, the, in that space of four characters. Now this piece was in the hands of an Italian dealer who said that it came to him as a counterfeit. He didn't think it was a counterfeit because it looked really good and the paper felt 100% correct. I said, Franco, look at the seal. A doesn't go with New York. A is Boston. 
New York is B. So, you know, there's this screaming evidence right here that this note isn't original, despite the fact that he thought it, you know, was a pretty nice note. Well, it turns out this is another one of those notes that was made on stripped $1 paper. The, the paper was stripped off the, the note, the, the ink was stripped off the note, and the paper was then used to lithograph. This is not inkjet or laser. This is a lithographed hundred on the original paper. Now, the, the paper actually does feel a little bit fuzzy from that, the process of stripping off the ink of the original note, but it's still, as it circulates, you know, it gets a little bit fuzzy feeling anyway, so, uh, and this guy was an experienced paper money dealer. I mean, he'd been handling notes for decades. He knew what a $100 note ought to feel like, and he said, this note feels pretty good to me, but even he as a dealer didn't understand this bit of the code that we use in Federal Reserve System. So, as I said, absolutely, I'll buy it, send it over. <laughs> he actually brought it over to fun one year and handed it to me there. So we're back to here. So what are your questions? <laughs> really like to collect those and sometimes they'll trade for more than an original but on the foreign stuff the world stuff it's the opposite right there's not really the value or are they still sought after well it just depends on what counterfeit you're talking about okay, what country uh, you collect. yeah yeah if you're if you're looking at things like the uh, I can't think of the guy's name now the the Hungarian who counterfeited the Czech 500 Corona note in 1919 uh, the, the original note is still worth much more than the genuine because the originals were withdrawn because of the counterfeits. Uh, but, but the counterfeit uh, is still worth six or seven hundred dollars. Uh, so there's, there is, and of course the, uh, the English counterfeits, the Bernard notes, they, they don't sell for as much as genuine because they're so common, but they don't sell for nuts. I mean, they're, they're they're hundred dollars and up. Uh, I saw one on the floor here yesterday, priced about sixty dollars, which I thought was, a, you know, an appropriate price for a Bernard in that condition. Uh, but there, there are lots of examples both ways of of value of, of of vintage, intended for circulation counterfeits. Now, when you're talking about counterfeits that are made to sell to collectors, obviously those should have zero value. Uh, unfortunately, there are still a few nuts like me around who collect them and, <laughs> and, and support the market <laughs> of, the, of these counterfeiters. You know, most of the support is coming from people who think they're buying a genuine note, okay. but there are still a few people like me who are spending the money to buy the counterfeits, knowing they're counterfeits, or suspecting they're counterfeits and wanting to see what the guys produced this time with this note. I mean, this guy in England. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll bounce around from note to note to note, and right now he's uh, counterfeiting Pakistani markings on Indian notes, because the Pakistan notes sell for more than the Indian notes of the same, you know, without the markings. Wow. So he can, he can make a, a good sum of money, especially on the two rupees. He's selling those for over 200, 250 pounds a piece. And I didn't know at the time that it was a homemade error, you know, instead mm. of the real thing. That's neat. Could I ask you about that? I mean, you're following this guy like Ahab following away. I mean, <laughs> uh, he knows you are following him. Yeah. And so, because he must be adjusting his counterfeits because he's reading something that you're posting on like IBNS forum, or he knows you're getting feed. I mean, is there any kind of feedback that you are inadvertently perhaps creating? by your own expertise. I mean, this guy is aware of you. He's aware that you're onto him. Well. Because he knows he's changing his eBay uh, identity, to be sure. But he's also changing his counterfeits in order to correct for mistakes that you, you, you yourself are pointing out. Is that, is that true? I don't think the guy's reading now would be on his forum. You have to be a member to get to the forum. And as far as I know, he's not a member. But he's fixing things. 
uh, well, he's, he's not, he, on any given counterfeit, he's not making any fixes. He's not making any changes. He's ch switching over to different counterfeits, but he st still continues to sell the same old ones. You know, that Greek piece he's been selling for years, he has improved that over the years, but I don't think that was as a result of anything that, that I pointed out. The Fazan, he... I think it's the Fazan, and you said, he, he this is the one you think is genuine, and then all of a sudden he begins to take your judgment and, and sticks it into the later counterfeiters. Counterfeit. Oh, right. Well, he also stole Ruth Hill's Fazan stamp, the, the one on the Heritage website uh, that Ruth Hill was own, the owner of is also showing up on his notes now. Now, that, that stamp originally was hung off the edge of the note, so the corner of the note was cut off. And he's, he was initially putting it there with that corner cut off. Then he went back and repaired that. So we're out of time. Uh, I'm cutting into the next guy's time here. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>